Have you ever wondered where the eight-hour workday came from? One man was instrumental in creating this, trying to make life better for those in society forced to work long hours in terrible conditions. This video looks at the life and accomplishments of Robert Owen, a Welsh philanthropist who changed the working day, tried to improve the lives of his workers and all those in poverty, established the cooperative movement in Britain, and even tried to start his own utopian city in the heart of America. Robert Owen was born in Newtown, a small town in Montgomeryshire, Wales, on May the 14th, 1771. He wasn't born into wealth. His father, Robert Owen Sr., worked three jobs as a saddler, ironmonger, and the local postman. His mother, Anne Williams, was the daughter of a farmer. Robert was one of seven siblings, but two of them had died while only young. This wasn't unusual for the 18th century, in which a high proportion of children died before they were five. When he was old enough, he attended the local school, but at that time, focus was more on a moral education. This meant that although children had a grounding in Bible stories and perhaps some practical skills, they received little in the way of reading, writing or mathematics. Despite this, Robert found he had an affinity for books and he became an avid reader. At the age of 10, his school time was at an end and he was apprenticed to a draper in Lincolnshire for four years. A draper was a wholesaler of cloth that was mostly destined for the clothing trade. Alongside learning his trade, his employer had a good library, which he allowed the young Robert to continue to learn from. At 14 years old, Robert went out into the world to earn his way, continuing to work in drapery shops until the age of 18, when he decided to move to Manchester. In 1787, Manchester was in the perfect location to expand with the rapidly growing cloth industry that was powered by the spinning jenny, the beginning of the industrial revolution for cloth. It wasn't long before Robert showed his skills at business and was first employed at Satterfield's Drapery in St Anne's Square. It was here that he would get his first taste of entrepreneurial spirit. Here Robert met Ernest Jones, a young engineer, and the two planned to go into business together, making spinning mules. They were a new invention for spinning cotton, and Robert borrowed a hundred pounds from his brother for his share, about 5,800 British pounds in today's money. A huge amount to borrow, and the partnership dissolved after just a few months. He sold his share of the business to set out on his own. With just three workers, Robert set up a new company with the same spinning mules in a rented factory space. He also took on a job as a manager at Piccadilly Mill, the first mill in Manchester to be powered by a steam engine, and later turned down a partnership here to go into business with two other people. They opened and ran the Cholton Twist Mills in Cholton on Medlock, an inner suburb of Manchester. No doubt this would shape his understanding of the problems within mills and the way people employed in them had to work and live. Robert was just 23 years old at this point, from a humble background, but already he was running several of his own businesses, making vast amounts of money and had become a learned and well-read student of many subjects. This was recognised when he was invited to join the Manchester Literary and Philosophical Society. This was a place for like-minded men to meet and discuss matters of philosophy or learning and present papers to one another. However, this was no doubt where Robert started to pick up more on socialism and matters of social reform, which would shape the way he lived his life going forward. And when the Manchester Board of Health was set up in 1796, Robert Owen was invited to represent the cotton industry looking into the health and well-being of workers in the mills. Just a few years later, in 1799, Robert travelled to Scotland and met Anne Caroline Dale, daughter of the prominent Glasgow philanthropist and mill owner David Dale. Not much is known about Anne's life before this point, but they fell in love and married on the 30th of September, 
It wasn't very long before they started a family, and they would go on to have eight children, the first who died as a baby. Their surviving children were four sons and three daughters, and many of them would follow in their father's footsteps for many of his plans and schemes throughout his lifetime. Marrying Anne Caroline also meant that Robert was now in with his father-in-law and his mills at New Lanark. New Lanark was already seen as a model cotton mill, mostly due to David Dale's efforts. As was normal for the time, around 500 of the 2,000 employees at the mill were children, and 300 of these were apprenticed orphans from the local workhouses of Glasgow and Edinburgh. The parish would have sent them out to local businesses in order to reduce costs, as their room and board was supposed to be covered by their new employers while they learned new skills. In reality, these children were often made to work long hours for dangerous, exhausting work and got very little in the way of food or clothing in return. David Dale, however, treated his apprentice children very differently. They were well fed and had proper places to sleep, were given two sets of clothing which was laundered regularly and most importantly, they were given an education alongside learning practical skills at work. While to modernise this is still fairly horrific, as the children had to work from 6am until 7pm, with only breaks for breakfast and dinner, this was still an improvement over most conditions for poor children, whether orphans or not. When Robert Owen came on the scene, he picked up where his father-in-law had left off. In July, just a few months after his marriage, he bought the new Lanark Mill from David and became its sole owner and manager. While conditions had been better for the orphan children there than most, they, and the other poorer employees of the mill, were still victim to the worst parts of society at that time. Poverty created an environment in which theft and drunkenness were rife, and education was practically non-existent. Those who lived at the bottom rung of society had little choice but to work in the factories and mills, and even though New Lanark was better than most, the employees still had to go back to their homes and lives that took what little they had. Robert set about establishing his own improvements for his workers, starting with his mill's truck system. A truck system was in place at many mills, and consisted of workers being paid with a currency that could only be spent in the mill's shop, usually at ridiculously inflated prices. It remained this way until the Truck Acts, from 1831 to 1887, enforced employees being paid with common currency. However, New Lanark was different. Although currency could only be spent in the mill's local shop in the village, the prices were only a little above cost making it far cheaper than anywhere else the employees could have gone. Alcohol sales were strictly supervised in order to try and reduce drunkenness. The profits from the shop even went towards a free school in the village set up for the children who worked in the mill. These ideas led to Robert being known as the founding father of the British cooperative movement. The village's free school was the first infant school in Britain. Robert didn't believe in using corporal punishment, and instead used encouragement for the young children. The curriculum also included arithmetic, reading and writing, but rather than the religious education that he had been taught with his limited education, dancing and music was taught instead. The emphasis was on the development and happiness of the young students, something that rings true in modern education. One of the weavers in the mill, James Buchanan, had worked at the school and was later put in charge of the first infant school in England, in Westminster, in 1818, as New Lanark's was so successful. Education was even put in place for teenagers and adults, with the Institute of Formation of Character, which not only taught those who were too old for the infant school, but also held concerts and speeches. The other important development for the mill was in how the workers were encouraged in their work. Most mills were heavy-handed, 
punishing employees for the slightest infraction with the severest of punishments. But Robert developed a system known as the silent monitor. This was a cube held near each employee's workstation and was painted with a different color on four of its faces. Excellent work was the white side, good work was yellow, adequate was blue, and black, based on the Scottish term black affronted, which meant embarrassed, was for poor work. There were also fines for drunkenness, and between these two reforms, the workers were encouraged to be on their best behavior, purely on their own merit. While it doesn't seem as though this would be much of an incentive, it was actually highly effective, as Robert's employees wanted to leave a good impression as he treated them far better than other employers might have. All of these changes stemmed from Robert Owen's core beliefs that people were shaped by their environment, for better or worse. He believed that many of the problems in poverty-ridden neighborhoods could be blamed on the conditions people were forced to live in, and if these were improved, it would make the lives of these people happier and healthier. In 1810, he raised the issue with Parliament of an eight-hour day and set about putting this into practice at New Lanark. Owen would later encapsulate this in a phrase, eight hours labor, eight hours recreation, eight hours rest. Essentially, the typical modern working day. Most people in the early 19th century, including children, worked anywhere between 10 and 16 hours of back-breaking work. However, as much as his groundbreaking ideas were a success, and the mill continued to be commercially successful, Robert's schemes cost more money than his investors were prepared to shell out for. In 1813, he sold his share in the business, leaving him free to pursue other philanthropic pathways. But something to be remembered was not everything was so humane and cheerful about the new Lanark Mill. While the workers at the mill certainly had improved lives and education, not the same could be said for every part of the production line. The American Sea Island cotton used at New Lanark came from Barbados, then part of the British Empire. Slavery had not yet been abolished, and the cotton used here almost certainly came from slave plantations. Over the course of the 19th century, cotton would grow to become the fabric of choice for British and European clothing, overwhelmingly relying on slave-grown cotton from the USA's southern states by mid-century. While Robert Owen was undoubtedly a reformer in one aspect, his chosen business would increase misery for thousands more. Robert began to tour Britain, giving lectures and talks on how to reform working places such as factories and mills. Unfortunately, while some small changes were made, the government of the time was not interested in implementing most of his ideas. He instead took to publishing his ideas, setting them out as essays, pamphlets and books. He rejected organized religion, instead choosing to become a deist, arguing that a divine being could only be realized through logical reasoning and observation of the natural world. This tied in with his belief that people could only improve their lives through cooperative working together. Later in the 1830s, he would give an address in which he told the working class people listening that they were deliberately being kept in poverty by not being given an adequate education. It wasn't long before Robert Owen became disillusioned by his lack of progress, and in 1825, he moved to America with the intention of starting a new self-sufficient community. Back in Britain, he had outlined his idea for a communal society of 500 to 1,200 people living in one large building with separate apartments but communal kitchens and eating areas. Children would be looked after completely by their family until they were three. Then, they would be raised by the entire community, with parents seeing them at mealtimes and in the evenings. While many liked his ideas about compassion and kindness doing more to reinforce good habits in society than brute force, 
many also didn't like his opposition to religion. If he had simply chosen to accept the beliefs of others, it might have worked. But Robert Owen publicly declared that believing in any religion was a block to progressing as a society, earning him plenty of opponents. Other critics included Marx and Engels, who believed that society would only improve if the working classes rose up and overthrew the capitalists. Whereas Owen wanted capitalists and those lower down the chain to work together. This included being opposed to expanding voting rights. Along with his son William, Robert bought a parcel of land in Indiana in January 1825 along the Wabash River. Within this site was a village named Harmony, which had been set up by a religious group that relocated to Pennsylvania. Owen renamed it New Harmony and set about remodeling the village into his model for a utopian socialist society. But he needed capital to keep his dream going and he sought out investors and partners, even giving addresses in Congress to entice people to join him. He finally managed to convince William McClure, a Scottish-born scientist and philanthropist living in Philadelphia, to move to New Harmony and become his financial partner. McClure wanted to use New Harmony to experiment with his model of an agricultural-based communal community. His involvement attracted yet more scientists, artists and socialists to move to Indiana and settle in New Harmony. Residents did make several firsts for the town, establishing the first public library, a civic drama club and a public school system open to both men and women. However, the town was not the success Robert had hoped for. He invited any and all to join him and his son, and as a result, despite attracting many interested people, this also attracted people looking for an adventure, or just out of curiosity, who were unlikely to try and make the experiment a success. William Owen himself noted in his diary that people coming to the town who had been comfortable and content in their old lives were unlikely to find any instant happiness in New Harmony. Robert's grand plan for a large communal building was never realized either, although bricks were fired for its construction. After a few months of chaos, leadership was finally established through the formation of a committee. A system was also worked out where residents were responsible for their own household goods but could work for or buy credit at the town's local store. During this time, Robert made his way briefly back to Scotland, selling his remaining mill interests and ensuring his wife and two of his daughters were financially secure in his absence. His four sons and his remaining daughter, Jane, all made their way out to the US with their father, settling in New Harmony. However, the experiment was to fail permanently as time went on. Although a worthy constitution had been laid out, basing each individual's tasks in the society on age, it failed to spell out anything about individual sovereignty or ownership of personal property. Residents began to have differences of opinion and tastes that went against the single vision of the town. It would seem Robert Owen's plan either left little room for the ideas of others, or maybe it left too much room. Other problems were Owen's resistance yet again to allowing different religions to exist within the town, and his inability to convince the American aristocracy to finance his utopia. After two years, most of the residents had left, in despair of ever having their viewpoints listened to or implemented, and the social experiment of New Harmony was done. However, the town itself continued, with some of his children staying on and remaining in the US. Robert Dale Owen, one of his sons, stayed on and later became a member of the US House of Representatives, helping to establish the Smithsonian Institute. David Dale Owen, his third son, became a noted geologist, and his youngest son, Richard Owen, became the first president of Purdue University. 
Robert Owen returned to Britain, his fortune depleted. He had sunk nearly £40,000 into his utopian vision, about 80% of his fortune. His sons in America swapped their shares in the new Lanark mills for shares in New Harmony's lands, paying their father an annuity of $1,500 for the rest of his life to help him financially. But while he was no longer the wealthy philanthropist he had once been, he found his ideas had found stronger roots in his absence, and he was recast as a leader of working-class unionists. Robert continued to promote free education, better working conditions, and healthy and livable conditions in the new factory towns that had sprung up. He tried to form many new societies and organisations, such as the National Equitable Labour Exchange, which used a time-based currency that exchanged labour for goods, and the Association of All Classes of All Nations in 1835, which attempted to combine all unions into a single effective confederation. But despite his persistence, most of his efforts came to nothing, with one exception. The cooperative movement was starting, by 1846, to build on itself, and new cooperative societies were springing up in places like Rochdale. In 1854, at the age of 83, and in spite of having declared religion false, Robert became interested in spiritualism. He converted to it after sitting several times with Maria B. Hayden, an American spiritualist who is credited with influencing the development of it in England. He even publicly announced his newfound faith in the beyond in his own publication, The Rational Quarterly Review, stating that he had made contact with Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, amongst others, for the purpose of changing the present false, disunited and miserable state of human existence for a true, united and happy state, to prepare the world for universal peace and to infuse into all the spirit of charity, forbearance and love. Unsurprisingly, as he aged and his views became more radical and extreme, they fell out of fashion. His influence vanished, and Robert Owen became an unknown figure. He moved back to the town of his birth towards the end of his life, going back to Newtown in Wales with his wife, penniless except for the pension his sons paid out to him. On the 17th of November, 1858, Robert Owen died at the age of 87. There had been times Robert Owen had managed to rub people up the wrong way by refusing to acquiesce to tolerance of religion or by being unbending in his ideas when it involved other people. There was a controlling element to his personality and he wouldn't always take on board the opinions of others, even when it would help. But regardless of these flaws, Robert Owen did an enormous amount to improve the lives and condition of the working classes and truly tried to change society for the better with his utopian ideals. He was responsible for being the founder of the cooperative movement in Britain and for creating the first infant schools in Britain. Through his efforts in New Lanark and New Harmony, he established public libraries and schools, all for free to allow everyone an education. His legacy even continued with the efforts of his children, who went on to press for reform and change as their father had. His reforms were ahead of his time, and his constant push for social change brought real reform for children and women and for the rights of the working classes. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.